G'day. This video is going to provide you with the skills to understand Venn and Moment diagrams. And the understanding of these diagrams is critical for any structural engineer. This video will cover the basics to allow you to master these diagrams. We'll also cover how they are related to each other and what these diagrams actually mean for the stresses within inside a beam. My name is Brendan, your structural engineer based in Australia, and I provide videos for the field of structural engineering that will help you progress your career faster, both technically and professionally. So don't forget to subscribe to, don't, to not miss any videos. Now let's get into it. Before we get into drawing these diagrams, there's a couple of basics we need to cover so we can have a fundamental understanding of how beams are supported and loaded. So what forces can be on side of beam? There are three primary forces that can be on side of beam. That's a concentrated force, a uniformly distributed load, or UDL for short, or a concentrated moment. Now that we've covered loads, we'll go over the supports that a beam can have. And there's three typical supports that a beam can have. That's either a pin support, a roller support, or a fixed support. And each of them have the unique capabilities for supporting the structure. A pin support, it stops translation both vertically and horizontally in the structure, but it allows for rotation. A roller support, now that only prevents translation vertically, but it allows translation horizontally and rotation as well. So the fixed support that prevents translation vertically, horizontally and rotation. So each one of those, if it prevents that translation, you'll see a corresponding reaction at that location. Now that we've covered both the supports and the loads that can be inside a beam, what do bending moment and shear force diagrams actually represent? They're a graphical representation of the stresses seen along the beam. So the shear force diagram is a graphical representation of the shear stress in that beam. A shear stress is a stress that's perpendicular to the axis of the beam, whereas a bending moment induces a normal force in the beam. A normal force changes with the depth of the beam and can also be either in compression or tension. So when we have a bending moment that's causing the force to sag at the bottom, it's causing a tension at the bottom of the beam and causing a compression at the top because of the strands at the bottom of the beam are having to extend further than they are at the top of the beam that's in compression. Now, why are these forces actually induced in the beam? They're induced in the beam so we maintain equilibrium. We know we need to maintain equilibrium for the structure to be stable, otherwise it'd be moving. Now for a 2D frame, there's three primary equations we have for equilibrium, and that is that the net forces in the horizontal direction must sum up to zero, all the net forces in the vertical direction must also sum up to zero, and all the moments must also sum up to zero. And this is for any point along that beam. From these three simple equations, we're able to equate what the shear force is, what the bending moments are, and also equate the reactions at the supports. Now, before we get into drawing these diagrams, we also need to go through the sign convention we're going to use. So any load that is vertically going down, that will be a positive force. And likewise, we'll use the same sign convention for shear. So any shear stress that is going down, that will also be a positive. Whereas for bending moments, any bending moment that causes the bottom of the beam to be in tension, so if the beam is sagging, that will be a positive bending moment. While any bending moment that's causing the top of the beam to be in tension, so it's hogging like over continuous support, that will be a negative bending moment. Let's get started. Now we start by drawing a free body diagram. A free body diagram is a graphical representation of the supports and loads that are inside that beam. For simplicity in this video, we're going to go through a simply supported beam, so a pin on one side and a roll on the other. More complicated structures like continuous beams, these are required to consider boundary conditions beyond just the three simple equilibrium equations. Now that we've gone through both, what supports and loads can be inside a beam and what free body diagrams are, let's get around to drawing the bending moment and shear force diagrams. As we said, we need to start by drawing our free body diagram. So let's take our simply supported beam with a pin on the left and the roll on the right and a point load in the middle. What we'll do when you're running through these examples is have one off to the left, that will be done by variables, so you can apply that to any problem you have, and one on the right, which is a worked example of how we calculate it. What supports do we have? Well, we have restraints both vertically and horizontally for the pin, and only a vertical restraint for the roller. And when we look at the load, as the load is vertical, there is no net horizontal force. Therefore, the horizontal force on the pin must equal zero. Now, how about the vertical loads? Well, we can use our equilibrium equation for moments to work out what the vertical reactions are. Let's take the moment around RB. As this means that we only have one unknown at this point, which is the reaction at RA, as we know the magnitude of our point load P. 
So what moments are around that point? Well, we have the moment P that is the distance off RA. In our worked example, that happens to be five kilonewtons. But if we're working with a different variable that's not centered, it will be L minus X. Now that we have the moment induced by that point load, we just need to divide that by L to equate it back to the reaction force. So therefore, RA is equal to P times L minus X divided by L. Now, how about RB? We can use that same moment equation and equate the forces around RA. However, with the other equilibrium equation for vertical forces, that they must also equate to zero. From that, we know that P minus RA must equal to RB to satisfy this situation. So now that we have both the reactions at both points, let's get into driving the shear force diagram. What we'll do is we'll take a second cut through the middle of the beam and look at all the forces to the left of that point. As we're taking a section cut at that concentrated point load, it is not seen inside this section cut. So the only force we have to the left of that point is the reaction force RA. And because of that, we know that the shear force at that point must be the same, so we get a straight line as there is no other forces imparting upon it until we get there. In our worked example, as you can see here, we calculated a reaction force of 15, and there before we go draw a straight line right across till we get to our point load. Now that we've calculated the shear force up to that point load, let's move past there and work out what the shear force is beyond there. As we can now see that reaction force, we now have the reaction force RA and we have P in this situation. So therefore, RA minus P must be the shear force at this location. Now that will again be a straight line right across until we get back to the reaction on the far side. And after we get there, we just send any check to ensure that all our sums up to zero. So the shear force on that side must equal to the reaction force of RB, provided we equated it correctly. Now, how about the bending moment? Let's take that, take that same section cut through the concentrated point load and look at the force to the left of it. As we can see here, the only force we have again is the reaction force. So therefore, the bending moment at this point is RA times X. Now we could have taken that section cut at any point along that beam, and it would just be that reaction force times the distance we are R away. Now after we move past P, we could do the same summing the moments around that point where we have the concentrated point load and the reaction interacting with the bending moment diagram. However, as there is no forces to the right of it, we can take that same section cut and look to the right and see that the only force we have beyond there is the reaction RP. So therefore, we go back to that same equation we had before, but we change, instead of RA, we change it for B. And again, we get a straight line all the way to the support. As you can see here, the concentrated point load creates a triangular shape. And from this, we can also see that where the shear force diagram crosses zero is where our peak moment occurs. Now, let's get into uniformly distributed loads. So we draw our same free body diagram with a pin on the left, a roll on the right, and a uniformly distributed load a distance off our RA reaction. As you can see, like, like the concentrated point load, there is no horizontal reactions and there's only one horizontal restraint. So therefore, to satisfy the horizontal equilibrium equation, this must equal zero. Now, how about the reactions? Well, we can take the same equilibrium equation for moment by summing the forces around RB with one additional step. We need to equate that uniformly distributed load to a point load and center it in the center of the uniformly distributed load. So as you can see here, the formula looks a little bit more complicated, but it's really broken down to the same principles. Where U times A, where A is the length of the uniformly distributed load, is equal to the magnitude of that load. And the distance it is off RB is equal to L minus X minus A on 2, as that is the center point of the uniformly distributed load. So from that, we now have the reactions at each point. Let's take a section cut at the start of the uniformly distributed load and look at the loads to the left of that point. As we can see, the only load to the left of that point is the reaction. And therefore, the only force imparting upon it is that reaction force. Until we get to the start of the uniformly distributed load, we have a straight line equal to the reaction force. Once we move into the uniformly distributed load, we start having forces imparting upon it, depending on how long we've moved across. So the shear force will reduce at a gradient equal to the magnitude of the uniformly distributed load, which in our case was three kilonewtons. This gradient will remain constant until we get to the other side of the uniformly distributed load, at which point we'll go back to a straight line, as there is no more additional forces imparting upon it. Now for a sanity check, we've gone back across and we know that the bottom of that uniformly distributed load must be equal to the reaction at RB, which it does. So we say, therefore we satisfy that situation. All net vertical forces must sum up to zero. How about the bending moment? We'll take that same section cut at the start of the uniformly distributed load. This equation leads back to the simple equation we're using for point loads, and it's also a straight line up until this point. So therefore, the start, at the start of that uniformly distributed load, it's just the reaction force to the left of our reaction, RA, times the distance we are away. Once we start moving into the uniformly distributed load, we need to start 
counterbalancing that bending moment by the amount of load that's imparted from the uniformly distributed load in the section card. We could do this by equating each of those little points to a point load, equating the moment it induces at that point. However, there is an easier way, and that's understanding the relationship between bending moments and shear forces. So what is that relationship? It has a relationship in calculus. We know that the integral of the shear force is equal to the bending moment diagram. And likewise, the differential of the bending moment diagram is equal to the shear force. The relationship also extends back to the loads that are applied on the structure, where the inverse differential, the shear force, is equal to the loads and reactions. So if we know one of these diagrams, we should be able to work out the others from this. What this also tells us is that we're able to work out peak bending moment is where it crosses the center line of the shear force diagram, as this is the calculus relationship. Let's go back to our example. So calculating the peak bending moment is as simple as equating the area under the curve up to the point we cross zero. As we already know the bending moment at, at the start of the uniformly distributed load, we only need to calculate the triangular area under the curve up to the, where it crosses zero. From this, we have everything we need to know to calculate this. As we know that up until the start of the uniformly distributed, the shear force is equal to RA. And we know that the gradient of that line is U. Therefore, the distance it is from the start of the uniformly distributed load to where it crosses the zero point is just RA on U. Now that we have the distance and the magnitude of the shear force at that point, it's as simple as equating these two together. So it's just RA times the length to the zero point divided by two equals the area under the curve. Now if we add that to MX, which is the value that we calculated at the start of the uniformly distributed load, this will be the peak moment. We could just sum all the areas under the curve and get the same answer. So when we're going through our bending moments and shear force diagrams, this is a quick sanity check to ensure that we've drawn them correctly. Do all the shear forces in the bending moment sum to zero? Does the peak bending moment occur where we cross the zero point? Now, I'll just quickly break down what happens if we have a uniform distributed load and a point load. But all the same principles apply. To simplify this question, you can split it off into its two separate components. One where you do a calculation for the uniform distributed load, as you can see off to the left, and one where we do the calculation for the point load, which is off to the right. After we drive each of these diagrams, we can superposition on top of each other to get the final result. As you can see here, let's try and check that our bending moment and shear force diagrams are correct. Do both of them sum up to zero? As you can see here, they have both equated to zero as we finish across from support to support. Does the peak bending moment occur where we cross the zero point? As we can see here again, the peak bending amount of 51.42 kilonewtons does occur where we cross the zero point. And where the uniformly distributed load is, is the only section that is not a straight line. So as we can see, we've satisfied ourselves for these requirements. Hopefully this helps you master these diagrams. And if you do want me to cover anything else, like continuous beams, for example, please comment below. And now here's a link to some other videos about career progression that might help you within the field of structural engineering. And if you did like this video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe on it. Anyway, look forward to seeing you in the next episode.